So infants generally 1% hydrocortisone, preschoolers usually 1% for the face, maybe that and sometimes that for the body. School age, mild on the face and on the body, stronger. I'm not talking about groins here because we're not treating groins in patients with eczema. That's a different matter entirely. Um, so there's been a lot of concern out there in the community about skin thinning. Um, who can tell me what skin thinning is? Is anyone here worried about skin thinning from steroid? Mm -hmm. But do you know what it is? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that a lot of people know what it is, but they've been told they have to be careful about it. So skin thinning would essentially be atrophy of the epidermis. So the um, stratum corneum would be thinner, you get telangiectasia, and you can get loss of some of the normal um, increased transepidermal water loss because you lose the barrier function and um, a, a thinner dermis and epidermis. So you can see it with steroids, but you have to be working pretty hard to get skin thinning, particularly in children. Adults, it's a little bit different, but children, you have to be working very hard. And so this is a paper that came out of Sydney a few years ago, and they looked at 70 children under the age of 18 years who are tending with eczema. Mean age was three, so it's quite that young eczema age group, which is what we treat. That's good. And they got them to use a potent steroid for flares of the eczema, so either they were using mometasone or beta. And they were um, using that daily for flares, stepping down to a moderate or mild steroid and then stopping when it was clear. Aiming over this time to keep their eczema severity score less than one, so like virtually clear of eczema. And so they were using quite a bit of steroid cream. The average amount used per month was about 100 grams of the potent steroid per month over a 10-month period. And they compared the children who were being treated for that with a group of children who were attending dermatology clinic for other reasons, so moles or alopecia, who weren't using any steroid cream at all. And they found no difference in skin thickness measured by transepidermal water loss or telangiectasia compared to the control group. So there were three kids with telangiectasia in this group, but there were also three kids with telangiectasia in the control group. So it seems to be pretty safe. And I would certainly say in my experience, I've found it pretty unusual to see local side effects from steroid creams in children. I find it very common to find children with undertreated eczema. And so my general message is that you should be using a cream that works so well that you can stop using steroid cream most of the time. If you're needing to use steroid cream day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month, continuously, it's not probably getting rid of the eczema and it's not working. So you should expect a treatment to be reasonably effective at managing the eczema. Um, so people wean down their steroids in a couple of different ways. A number of practitioners like they wean down in frequency so, uh, in potency, so they'll use mometasone to start with. As things get better, they might step down to aristocort and then to 1% hydrocortisone and then stop. I tend to wean by reducing the frequency with which people use the steroid cream. And it's a personal preference. I my idea is that it's better to have fewer different creams in the house because otherwise it gets too confusing. That's my thought. Um, but I think if it's not working, then you need to reassess what you're doing. The times that I think you have to be concerned about long-term use is if you're using it in the flexures, so that's in the groin area, certainly under the nappy area. Most of the cases of um, systemic um, of uh, adrenal suppression from uh, po topical steroids in infants have been with potent topical steroids like Dermol used in the nappy area over periods of time. Um, face, probably not ideal to use stronger steroids there for a long time. And teenagers, you do have to be careful because steroids can promote stretch mark development. Um, so you have to be a bit careful, <coughs> particularly around the arms and the thighs in teenagers. One of the um, concepts that I think is really helpful in treating eczema is this idea of maintenance treatment. So as this graph shows, the idea is that you put your steel, you've got bad eczema here, you put your steroid on every day to get it under control, 
and then you keep it under control by applying the steroids regularly every Saturday and Sunday to the areas that are prone to eczema. So for people who are prone particularly to elbows, knees, dorsum of feet type eczema, which is a lot of people, this weekend maintenance treatment can be very helpful at preventing flares. And there's a few studies now looking at this, following patients for somewhere between 6 and 12 months, who found that um, you put the weekend steroids on every weekend, no matter how it looks. So even if there's no eczema there, you put the creams on there, because it probably is at a microscopic level, but you can't see it. You put the steroids on every weekend, and they get many fewer flares, and they actually end up using less steroid cream over that period of time because they don't get the flares. And you so continue to use moisturiser over the Moisturiser every day. Yeah. Steroid creams don't only need to be put on once a day. Yeah. There's no evidence that twice a day is much better. Maybe a little bit, but not a lot. And I think if people do it once a day, it's more manageable. Certainly three, three or four times a day is unnecessary for steroid creams. Um, and so I get them to do it every Saturday and Sunday. And I say, so until you've had a few months where you haven't had any flares, and then generally I find after people haven't had any eczema for two or three months, they usually forget. Um, but that's, that's sort of where, what I'm aiming for. I want people to be able to step down so that they can do it just two days a week. If they're managing it well like that, then generally it's pretty good. If they're still needing to use that three months steroid creams most days of most weeks, then you're not quite winning. Um, antiseptics. Um, there's a few different antiseptic bath preparations. I am a fan of the dilute bleach bath. Um, this is the study that first looked at it. This is back in, published in Pediatrics back in 2009. It's an American study and they, they did it alongside a two-week course of Kefalex and an intranasal mepiracin. Now I, I don't normally do that, um, partly because I don't like using a lot of topical antibiotics because of bacterial resistance. But there have been other studies since this one looking at the inclusion of bleach baths on top of a normal eczema treatment plan. There's been a study from Malaysia and we did a pilot study in Auckland that has shown that the addition of dilute bleach baths improves eczema severity over and above standard care. Generally, I think they're very well tolerated. Um, there are a few people who really don't like them. That's okay. Um, the alternatives, however, are um, uh, Oilatum Plus or alpha, uh, alpha QV Flare-Up. They both contain triclosan, which has been implicated in driving MRSA resistance and things. So, um, and they tend to find that's a little bit more irritating as well than the dilute bleach bath. <coughs> but that is an option for families who don't like bleach. And there are instructions on how to do the bleach bath on the eczema network website. Um, other treatments. Anti if there's clinical signs of current infection, so there's pustules, crusting, those sorts of things, then yes, a course of antibiotics would be appropriate. And usually um, Kefalex and a flucloxacillin would be what I would choose. Amoxicillin doesn't really have a place for treating infected eczema doesn't cover the staphylococcus well enough. So going back to the bleach bath, can they do it when they've got an eczema flare or something? <coughs> I do it, I do it all the time. All the time? Yep. Mm. Yeah. You, sh you can do it when you have a flare, but no, I do it regularly. Um, so antibiotics, I usually do about seven days usually. Um, antihistamines, I don't prescribe a lot of non-sedating antihistamines for eczema because they don't actually treat the disease. Um, a lot of the itch isn't histamine driven, so most patients find they're quite disappointing in terms of benefit. Um, if they do find that they're really helpful and they feel much less itchy with the antihistamine, that's fine. I'm, anything that stops them scratching is good with me, generally. Um, I do sometimes use sedating antihistamines to help them have good night's sleep. But actually the thing that helps best with the itch is using the steroid and moisturiser cream. That's more helpful. Um, so this is just going back to the brick wall model of the skin barrier, just to... I, I use this a lot when I'm explaining treatments to families because I think it's really important because it helps them understand the importance of restoring that natural skin barrier function in the long-term care of their child. And so we talked before about the normal skin 
nice strong bricks, lovely fatty mortar, waterproof, everything just bounces off. So, you know, irritants, allergies, just <laughs> no problem, happy child. <laughs> Um, and so this is the idea of, of you've got low levels of flagrant, so you get this, these broken, crumbly bricks and the gaps in the mortar, and the whole thing starts to fall apart, and things start to get through. And that's where you get the irritants and the allergens getting through, you get transepidermal water loss, you get dry, flaky skin, you get that itch, scratch, itch, scratch, itch, scratch, infection, itch, scratch, and scratch cycle. And the skin... <coughs> It's very hard for it to heal up. What I see the steroids is doing is helping calm the inflammation that's happening down here. So I stack the bricks up again, and the moisturizer is like your paint. See, so in house maintenance, so you do your paint over the top. You see, it's not gonna. So, so the steroids, as I said, stack the bricks up again. The moisturisers like the house maintenance, the paint on the outside, but the two of them do different jobs, so you can't just use one, you need to use both. And there are quite a few studies that show the more moisturiser you put on, the less steroid cream you need. Mm -hmm. So that moisturising is really important, shouldn't be neglected. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really important is to set a date for review. If you plan to review the patient in a one week or two weeks, you know it's a very short time frame, very hard to go wrong with steroid creams in such a short time. The family can feel relaxed and confident that they're not going to have side effects. They can trust you to keep an eye on that for them and they can concentrate on getting the eczema gone. Okay. So I think that's really important. Um, I think when you first see a child with eczema, it's very hard, often it's hard to assess for sure what kind of eczema they have. Do they have mild, moderate or severe eczema? Because often they're not really doing the right kind of treatment. So I find it's quite helpful to optimise the topical cares before you sort of assess which group of patients they fall into. If they settle down very quickly with that and are easily managed and are mainly just using moisturisers and occasionally use a bit of topical steroid once every couple of months, then that's mild eczema. If they're stuck in this more troublesome area where they've still, you think you've got things right, you've prescribed them the pattern, they seem to be using it, but they still look like they've got quite a bit of eczema, then I think it is important to reassess what's happening. So reassess what's happening. And so I've the things you need to think about, you think about adherence. So you need to find out how much of that steroid cream have they put on, how much of the moisturiser have they put on. Are they avoiding irritants? Are they still using that soap in the shower? Are they still putting um, Dettol in the washing machine, that sort of thing? Are they using an adequate amount and potency of topical steroid? Is there room to step up in that? Is there an active infection? Because if there is infection there, it can stop the steroid creams from being as effective. <coughs> Could they have an allergic contact dermatitis? <coughs> or a, just an irritant contact dermatitis to topical products? And patients can develop allergies even to steroid molecules. So it's worth thinking about that. Um, have you got the wrong diagnosis? Is this really something else? And that's the reason why it's not getting better. And the other group is, of course, they just have awful eczema. <laughs> and that's, that is a group, for sure. And so if you think you've found some things, address them, then reevaluate how things go. And I think um, that primary care is a good place for this. But I think it is also important to recognise when you need to forward it on. And a lot of areas now have eczema nurses who can help a lot with education and support and particularly where adherence is an issue that can be really helpful um, but also referral to dermatology or pediatrics or immunology depending what's available to you can be very important too um, so the things that should raise red flags to difficult to control eczema recurrent skin infections ongoing need for potent steroids multiple times a week severe <laughs> facial eczema Severe flares or eczema herpeticum obviously are more urgent and may require hospitalisation. 
where there's a significant impact from the eczema. So waking frequently at night despite whatever you can do, missing school activities or having a so-called social impact. <coughs> Management of comorbidities. So this is the family that's come in, they're excluding 20 foods because, or 25 foods, they're failing to thrive, all those sorts of things can be important. Or when you're worried that there might be another diagnosis. So that could be an atypical look to it, early age of onset, failure to thrive. So what do I do for the very severe cases? Well, there's a few options of other treatments of what you can do for bad eczema. Um, I would say that of patients referred to me by paediatric colleagues with a view to starting one of these, probably only about two thirds of them need to. Many of them, if we treat their topical treatment, we can get them better. So it is tend I think it probably is better in a secondary or tertiary setting. So narrowband UVB phototherapy, this can be a really good treatment for some patients. You stand in the box, you have the light shine on your skin, very safe, painless. The main issue with it is that patients need to attend a phototherapy unit three times a week for 12 weeks, so for many families that's a big challenge, and it's not easily available in more remote areas. Um, we use quite a bit of methotrexate and sometimes cyclosporin. Methotrexate is um, used in a very low dose, so it's predominantly immune modulating rather than terribly immune suppressing, and it can be very good for children with very difficult eczema. Um, we're in the process of auditing our patients at Starship and of the, we've treated about 50, 75% um, have been reporting being clear or near clear while on that. Um, but the question is how long do they stay like that after they come off it and that's part of what we're looking at. But that can be a very good treatment for difficult disease. Um, I don't use these as often because they're more immunosuppressive. Um, Generally, oral prednisone is not great for managing eczema. It, um, I did some training in the UK at Great Ormond Street. And my bosses used to use that many years ago, and they said it was good, but if you stop it quickly, you get rebound flaring. And so they used to wean patients off it over two years. And in terms of side effect profile, I don't think that's great. So I really prefer not to, I find a lot of patients who have been given a course of ready pred either by somebody who's done it for the eczema or for if they've had an asthma flare or something like that, they can sometimes need ready pred. The eczema becomes much more challenging to manage afterwards I find, it's much more difficult. So I really do try and stay away from that. <coughs> so my top tips. Use the online resources that's on our website. Um, plenty of moisturiser. Use topical steroids, don't be afraid to use them. Do your antiseptic baths. Actually, the other thing I should put in there is do weekend treatment. I think that's really, really helpful for many patients. And remember to reassess and refer if it's, your eczema is still troublesome. Uh, the last bit's really Jan's thing. Don't stop foods. I don't stop foods for treating the eczema, uh, but I will stop foods if there's a history of an immediate hypersensitivity reaction. Generally is what I do. Okay. Oh, and here's, here's a picture of our website. So it's got, it's got some um, guidelines for diagnosis and assessment of eczema, outpatient and primary care guidelines for managing it um, and then the information and handouts these sort of things like it's got the bleach bath instructions it's got information for families um, and it'll have the handouts as well and there's links to these videos about how to put your creams on